Hi, thank you for uh, staying awake, awake and attentive, and hopefully you'll still be there <clears throat> at the end of this. So, as Megan pointed out, we're, we're doing something very different with DNA Nexus than what a lot of the people in this room are doing. We're focused on the front end of study design before we can get to all the exciting variant calling and things like that. And so the partnership that we've developed has been really helpful to us because we're a large healthcare system. We deliver healthcare, and that's the priority. So you can see from the slide up here, Sutter Health is the fourth largest integrated delivery system in the US. Our footprint goes basically from the border of Oregon down to Santa Cruz, all the way out to the Sierra Mountains. So you can imagine that we have a very diverse population, um, racially, ethnically, socioeconomically. Uh, we see patients with every stage of disease from early to advanced, and we provide early and advanced care in hospitals family medicine, um, it's the whole spectrum. We have about three and a half million patients actually. Um, again, it's a large diverse network. So it's not like Kaiser where it's the same thing everywhere. Um, we've bought up different hospital systems. And so it's, you know, it's pretty diverse that way, which does provide um, quite a few challenges when it comes to doing research. So like I said, we're not a typically, we're not a research University, we're not a research institute, but we do do some research. But we've now sort of made this more uh, system wide, and so this is what we're doing. It's been about um, six months now since we've launched this. So we've created an office of the CRO, and under this office, we have different centers that have been developed. Mine's precision medicine. We also are scaling our clinical trials ability. We do a lot of clinical trials, mostly in oncology. We have more trials than Stanford and UC combined. Um, we are expanding our digital health center, ability to get into Epic and do the kinds of studies we've been talking about here as well as bringing this information to physicians to become more of a rapid learning center so physicians can actually learn from the data. So for the precision medicine um, focus, which I'm now honchoing, um, my, my job's pretty straightforward. I have to build a research program that helps our patients. So it's patient focused, and it's focused on discovery, validation, um, even translation of diagnostics for disease progression, um, monitoring progression, and monitoring treatment response. That's, that's the focus of this precision medicine program. And we're hoping that any discovery we have can then be translated, validated in our system, and then that can change the way we provide care. So we're not selling samples or data and hoping stuff happens with them. We're partners in every single one of these collaborations like Megan talked about today. And partnership is the only way we're going to make this happen. So we have a long list of very strong assets that I'll go through later on, but we're not building a genomics center. We're not building a bioinformatics infrastructure to manage the Genofino data sets. Um, that's why this partnership with DNA Nexus is so critical to, um, to the goals of our program. It doesn't mean that Sutter doesn't understand um, genetics or large scale uh, projects which involve um, biobanking and providing samples to partners. So we are um, the site for the TAPER study. TAPER is an American Society of Clinical Oncologists um, funded non-randomized clinical trial where patients who've had CLIA sequencing on their tumor can um, be qualified for an off-label use of an existing drug. Um, and so we're the only place in Northern California who are enrolling patients into this program. We're also part of the STRIVE study, or GRAIL. So GRAIL is at bringing in 80,000 patients um, at mammography. 40,000 of those are coming from sites all over Sutter. Uh, we are also the coordinating center for several large um, age-related cohorts, so studies um, in osteoporosis, um, and in men and women, and other large cohorts. And we contribute data um, to a lot of these large aging-focused um, charge consortium analyses, so we're also in that field as well. 
And one of the things we are building, um, everybody seems to be making biobanks, um, we're also building our own 100,000 patient biobank. This is completely funded through philanthropy and um, Sutter matching, so we own it and we get to um, use it how we want. And so we have um, a fully integrated EPIC single instance across all three million patients. So this allows us to identify cohorts um, for research. And we're focusing our 100,000 person biobank along our major service lines in oncology, in cardiovascular, in neurology. And so I can tell you where our 4,000 plus MS patients are receiving care. I can tell you where our 5,000 plus Parkinson's patients are receiving care, and that allows us to go out and identify them and ask them to enroll into this biobank. We can then consent. We can um, we, we biobank on scale. So basically anybody who receives, or I'm sorry, donates blood, <laughs> um, that happens when you come in for a normal um, blood draw for routine care. You sign a consent, um, we draw blood at that time, and it's basically routed out to our central facility in Livermore, and we then um, take your blood and aliquot and store it for, for later use. But the idea is that once a patient has joined the biobank, they don't hear from us again. We are just collecting blood when they come in, and we're collecting longitudinally, so as disease progresses or not, will have blood serum and plasma that matches um, that, that longitudinal um, change. We also have the ability and are doing very deep research um, on the basic side. So we have what we call our cancer avatar project. We've identified eight um, highly malignant, very treatment resistant um, cancers. We are bringing in or identifying 100 patients from each of these cancer types from um, our facilities here in San Francisco. And what we're doing is taking tumor material, um, creating cell lines, mouse avatar models, PDX mice, and doing um, high throughput sequencing on them, RNA-seq, high throughput drug screening, and working these up for um, every molecular test you know, we can do in our laboratory, as well as providing a CLIA test to the patient. And all that information then gets back to the patient and their physician. And this is how we're also creating a pipeline that allows us to inform a physician that their patient actually has a qualifying mutation for the TAPER program. So that's all built around this basic science program. So we do have the ability to do large projects. We're just developing the ability to do large-scale genomics now, because that's something where you know, we, 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 need to, we need to move into the, the next steps to work with you guys. So Megan mentioned this multiple sclerosis uh, study. And really, the goals here are to identify genomic features for progression, staging, symptoms, MRI changes, as well as response um, to therapy. And so from my side, these are things I, you know, I worry about. I'm not worried about variant calling or alignments or anything right now. I'm worried about how we get all of these data packaged so that it can go into the clinical side of the, of the data set. So it means I have a lot of work to do with our legal and compliance teams, our privacy team, our IRB. It's a healthcare system, we're very risk averse, so we you know, protect the patient's data and their rights, um, um, uh, which is the right thing to do, but it's, it's, this can be risky. So we just have to make sure that everything is done correctly and we have to track this information as a sample is used that the permissions for those use are, um, are followed. Um, consent, um, obviously we're consenting patients, but we are consenting them so that their biomaterials can be used for any use. We're not restricting the use to a particular disease or a particular type of assay. We can use them for anything, and we can use them multiple times to develop many biomarkers. Um, we also require the ability to recontact. Recontact means different things to different people. To some, it just means updating the electronic health record. Um, for others, it means actually contacting the patient on some expected interval, annually or whatever. 
So yes, we're, we're also including that in every consent. And patients, of course, always have the ability to withdraw. As I mentioned earlier, we have a single instance of EPIC that goes back over a decade. It actually goes back further um, for people who know um, Palo Alto Medical Foundation, PAMF. Their EPIC goes back about 30 years. And this includes you know, all the things you would expect from EPIC, so demographics, medical history, um, disease history. So these are things that we can provide um, at scale. And where EPIC may fall short, if the data quality isn't good, or there's data missing, like Megan mentioned, um, we just ask the patient, or we just ask their caregiver um, at the point of consent. So for instance, for this multiple sclerosis study, we'd really like to know more about the family history of autoimmune and maybe other diseases, maybe other health behaviors that aren't captured well in EPIC. We're adding that to the questionnaire. It's also possible if a, if a third party partner wants an enriched data set that includes like a physical performance um, uh, test like the EDSS, then um, we will have our clinic staff do that. So all these things are possible. We just have to design the study perfectly up front so that we can not have to keep going back. A lot of talk about imaging. We have um, image data over multiple years for these patients. Um, we can go forward um, uh, prospectively, but we could also go back retrospectively to pull up image data and the interpretation notes that go along with the image data. And along with all those assets which are data generating, we also do have a really um, talented team which is at our, um, we have a Walnut Creek facility that does work with our EPIC data. And they build custom apps for extracting data. They even, um, in collaboration with the UCSF uh, MS group, built a dashboard that's being rolled out in a lot of our clinics. And so what this dashboard does is it goes into different parts of the medical record and pulls them all in so that the clinician doesn't have to go find all this stuff because they've only got 15 minutes with the patient. And this has self-report data, um, uh, treatment data, image data, all in this one dashboard. Well, now we can actually use this to also collect the data for research. So it's a tool for giving care, but we're also using it as a tool to collect data for this type of research project. So these are, you know, these are the, the assets that you know, we're trying to pull together for this project, and clearly it needs to go into the, you know, a single database. And to that database then, we add the genetic data. So that has to be added to it, and that's what you know, DNA Nexus, you're the pros at this. And so what does it look like? We're gonna have this clinical genomic uh, database. Um, what, what, do, what do we expect from it? And what benefits do we think a partner will get out of this? Because we all have different needs. Um, so Sutter, what do we get? We get access to the sequence data. This, you know, this is data that, again, I'm not developing. I don't have the resources to do the sequencing. So we get to make our own analyses, our own discoveries. Um, what does a partner get? They get to right to access the data for their own discoveries, generating IP. Um, there are ways to make it exclusive or not exclusive. And we also give them the ability to recontact the patient or the, or the, um, the caregiver to have updated data sets. So from where I sit right now, we're, you know, we're in the bottom. We have um, really great assets, good strengths. And I see a world of potential collaborators out there. Um, and so sitting in the middle, the way we're thinking about this is DNA Nexus. And we're hoping that DNA Nexus can continue to be a matchmaker for us into this larger world of you know, academia or industry or governmental organizations who want to do large sequencing studies. And in that way, we see that data come from one side we provide clinical data from the other side. And this is a very simple way of looking at it, but what I'm learning as we move forward is that 
The arrows also go the other way. So we are learning to do a better job on our data side, so how to better curate our EHR, what the right questions to ask in a questionnaire will be. And so we're actually doing a better job of research just by working with DNA Nexus, who's, who's working with a partner that wants to have access to this data once we have the sequencing added to it. And then we feel the arrow also goes back because through our partnerships, our clinical experts, our own um, uh, statisticians and, and epidemiologists can also provide value back to a partner. So it's not just input of data, but it's also export of expertise that help us do a better job, where at the end of the day, my job is to bring solutions to our patients when it comes to disease progression and treatment response. And that's it. So if, that was fast. Sorry if I went too fast for you guys. You probably don't want to go home early or yeah. anything.